Hey man, let's give him a hand clap of, as he's coming tonight. Hey Amen. Pastor Wendy, God bless you, sir. We're privileged to have you here in Maryland. Amen. Come and take your liberty night in Jesus' name.
connected back with the Overtons, really through uh, Brother Mike Overton. And, uh, but uh, Brother Overton worked and came to Stockton, I guess met his wife in Stockton, yes. so you guys have some special memories there. And then he worked for my dad, yep. and uh, I worked for my dad. And <laughs> we made so much money, we didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> he, was, uh, he just spent, gave, paid us so much, and uh, that's sarcasm, if you want to know. <laughs> and, uh, but what he did give us was something worth a whole oh, lot more yes. than money. Give us an education of how to facilitate and how to sacrifice and how to do the work of God. Amen. And uh, today, a lot of people think that ministry is a nice, fat paycheck, mm -hmm. and uh, they think that ministry is driving a nice car, and it's uh, they have all these preconceived ideals. Um, and there is a lot of ministry, so-called, that is like that. But if you're going to do something for God, you're going right. to make some sacrifices. Right. You're going to give it yourself. Yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, missions is not just overseas. That's right. We go to a meeting or we bring in someone that's very gifted in communicating and they bring us to tears, and they should. We should be very touched by it the plight of others over across the waters, the Atlantic, the Pacific, in so much that we give and we sometimes get on planes and travel there, and sometimes we pray for them, and, 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 and we should never let that uh, be taken away from us. Right. But on the other hand, um, you can look in your own backyard and you have yes. more cultures and country then from different yes. continents here than you would if you went to one specific country overseas. Amen. I know right. in our, the church that I pastor, we just, we, we go up and down, you know, you, you're fluctuating, but right now we're at about 60 different uh, groups of people All represented right. from every continent in the world. All right. And, Amen. Uh, it's, uh, they come with different cultures, they come yes. with different backgrounds, they come with a, different, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And um, many of them are, are in here to become Americans, or they have become Americans. And uh, I'm very uh, outspoken about that. I think that if you're going to live in this land, you should work toward becoming a citizen. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not uh, feel that way, but I feel very strongly this is a great country. It's not a country without problems, uh, but it is a great country. And um, I'm so thankful to be an American. I was in the Philippines um, about eight weeks ago to minister. And we drove, uh, we, we flew into Manila, which is the capital of the islands of the Philippines there. And then went down, flew down to Davao, which is the second, has the, this is the largest city on the second uh, largest island, and those two islands pretty much have the majority. And uh, as we were getting on the plane, uh, Brother Jim Blackshirt and myself flying in there, the president called martial law. Now, some of you don't know what martial law is. You hear CNN and ABC and Fox or whatever you listen to or watch, or and you let the world tell you all about it. Well, I was there, and I can tell you what they told you. Most of it's not true. They tell a lot of lies, and then people come and say, you know, this is how it's going on, and they're just you're just repeating what somebody else lied about. Right, right. And uh, I've been in Israel when they've been in war, and I've watched the missiles come from Gaza by the thousands. One night I counted over 500 missiles come out of Gaza in two nights. And I watched them shoot the iron domes and shoot them down. To the alarm went off and told us we all had to go to the bomb shelter for a little while. There's just a lot of things that when you travel and you see and you come back and you hear what they're saying on the news, you say that that's just an absolute lie. 
And we got on the plane and they called martial law and uh, everyone was telling the president of that country, the Philippines, you know, he's just this horrible person and you listen to the United Nations and you listen to the European Union and you listen to a lot of American news and you'd think this guy is horrible. Well, actually, he's a pretty good president. And over 82% of the people in the Philippines like their president. That's a high rating. Yes, and we don't even get that with a Democrat or a Republican here. And uh, they like him. You know why they like him? Because he's bringing some order and some decency to their country. But while we was there, Malaysia is just across the strait there. And the Malaysians have, it's about 96% Muslims. They get in their boats and they come across the straight and join the ISIS cells that are in the Philippines. And so they called martial law. Martial law is if you're out past curfew, they shoot you uh, without uh, asking why you're out. And you have to be in at a certain time. But we had a meeting plan. And we had a thousand plus ministers and their wives that were there. And uh, they called martial law on us. So that night, they, uh, we went about an hour and a half over. And everybody was kind of nervous to walk home or to drive because of what martial law entails. And we told them, don't worry about it. The Lord will be with you. Everything will be fine. And the Lord was. Well, the next day, the government of that country uh, sent a bunch of soldiers to us and said, uh, we're going to protect you. We need to know how long you plan to continue this meeting, what you plan to do. And for three days, they surrounded our building. They put checkpoints up, and they wouldn't let any of the ISIS cells. And up the road, you'd hear them shooting. They killed 140 of them fighters up there and a few Filipino soldiers. And we had such peace in that service. We laid out on the floor. We snuffed and cried. We hugged each other's necks. We talked about the Bible. And we got protection from the soldiers that were fighting ISIS. is that uh, I've lived in this country for 51 years and I, I've never seen martial law called for the whole country. Right. I've never had to, other than the gangs that are in our city and they're quite often there, but seen my government send soldiers in and shoot down and have a big, and, and you take that for granted. It's a privilege to live in America. There's a lot of wonderful things in this great country. And so, my dad used to say, because we couldn't reach the world, God said, and uh, I remember when the first uh, group of uh, Asians came into Stockton, and I say Asians, I don't mean the Chinese, I don't mean the Japanese, but I mean the uh, Laotians, the Mongs, and the Vietnamese. We didn't have any of those until I was about uh, 16 years old. So I had been raised in a community that didn't have any of that. But what happened in Vietnam, we made deals with those peoples that they would help us. We would get them out of there if the communists crossed over. And so many of them came into refugee camps, were there for 10 years or so. And then finally our government anted up, kept their promise, and they picked uh, 10 cities in America to drop them off without interpreters and just pay for them to have rentals. And they came in by the thousands. And Stockton was one of those uh, 10 cities. I think it originally was five. It went to 10 eventually. But we were the original five cities. And they dropped off about 20,000 Laotians in, 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 in our city and they didn't speak a lick of English, and we hadn't even heard uh, the Laotians speak. And uh, we had two teenagers there, Chris and Christy, twins, a brother and sister. They were out knocking doors for Saturday morning to get their bus full, and the door opened, and here showed up this oriental face. And I don't mean that prejudice. You, you just have to understand. I'm just telling how it was. And uh, they tell, oh, where's... And then they realized they couldn't communicate. So they made little signs and pointed to the children. We'd take your children 
And they didn't know how much they got across. And that Sunday morning, they pulled up with a bus that seated 60 or 56 kids. And when they got to church, they had 96 on there. And they weren't just kids, they were adults, and they all decided to come. You know why? Because it was the first group of white-faced people that was friendly to them. Because everyone else hated them because we had Vietnam and we was against the Kongs or all the names we had for them. And, uh, and you have to reach the world, you have to get over prejudice. And it goes every way with every culture and every color. Yes, yes it does. Every culture has yes. prejudice. Uh -huh. Every culture has uh, differences that sometimes if you're not careful, you allow that to become a wall in your life to people. Right. Come on. Amen. Is that Brad over there? Yeah. <laughs> Got him back home for a few days. Yes. And, uh, you know, we couldn't communicate with them. Right. It's all right if I just take my time to talk about this. So, you know what we did? We formed a, my dad always had task force and stuff going. So, he got a task force that could draw. And you know what we did? We just started drawing pictures. And for six months, we did nothing but draw pictures and try and teach them English. You know what the pictures were? They were Bible stories. We drew crosses. We drew Roman soldiers. We drew Jesus. We drew this and we drew that. And would point. And you know what? They started getting the Holy Ghost. They couldn't speak our language, but we could tell when they got the Holy Ghost. They started getting baptized in Jesus. Sometimes we want the revival that it fits us and it fits our culture and it fits who we are Amen. and it's easy mm -hmm. believe me that was rough and for like four or five years we went to their houses to visit them and all the cats were disappearing in our neighborhood <laughs> they didn't know they ate cats over there oh I think the stones still do <laughs> And all the dogs started disappearing. They were roasting the dogs. You know, they you know, they ate everything. They come out of refugee camps. They were starving. They, they didn't understand American culture. And people hated them the more for that. And so it helped us because the more the city hated, you know, the, the, the Americans hated them and the church loved them, they gravitated us because we were the only ones with open arms. So. And what the, what the world was doing to them it was blessing the kingdom of God. Amen. And out of, out of that work, there are over 25 Asian churches with the Laotians that are in the, the United Pentecostal Church that they came out of that work and stopped it. So, so the point is, is that don't try and tell God how to do it. But whatever door opens up, yes. everybody in time has something to bring to the table. Yes. Some of those Laotians, they brought something to the table of Christian Life Center, and they yes. speak English. And how I do it in Stockton, it, if they speak the language, then they have to go to the mother church and be part of that church. Now they can help in these other churches. But we have these other churches, like a Laotian church or a Spanish-speaking church, because there are people that cannot speak English. Right. But once they can speak the mother tongue, it becomes prejudice. Mm -hmm. Oh, did I hit it now? Come on. Well, we want to have it because... Why do you want to have it? Because you're prejudiced. Right. Right. We want a Spanish church because you're prejudiced. Right. We want a Laotian church because you're prejudiced. Uh -huh. Once Come there's on. no language barrier... Yeah. You need to get used to the church being multicultural and coming together. That's right. We start these churches because there's barriers in language. But once that goes away, then we come together and start bringing our differences 
our worship, our singing, our preaching, our lives, and we begin to build. Because when you go to heaven, you're not going to have a Spanish church, an English church, the Ocean Church, or whatever church you're used to or think you're used to. They ain't going to be there. It's going to be one church, so you might as well start practicing it here, so you'll be ready for it over there. Amen. Ready for the Lord. And I have a, I have a staff, a, a pastoral staff, a paid pastoral staff, and it's represented by the demographics of my church. You got all different flavors. I mean, you pick what flavor you want. But they work for God and they work together and they don't say, well, I'm this color and you're that color on this culture. It ain't none of that. This is our church family and we're shepherds to working together to get them to heaven. And so I get bothered when I go to places and it's all one color. When people leave my church, and I, some of you may not come back for this, Brother Oakton, you can, but I don't apologize for it. I'm very outspoken about a lot of things, and this is one thing I'm very outspoken about. When I go to, uh, uh, when I have people that have to leave my church, and that does happen, someone has to leave for a job, or there's some family thing, it could be a lot of things, I tell them, I say, don't go to a church that is all one color. I have someone in my church that's black. I say, don't go to a black church. They're all prejudiced. <laughs> don't go to a Spanish church. They're all prejudiced. Don't go to a church that's all white people. They're all prejudiced. Right. Uh -huh. It don't matter what color they are. Whatever color they are, I tell them, don't go to a church that's all your color. Because right. that means they're prejudiced. Because there ain't no city in America... No city in America that hasn't been touched with the, with the demographics of colors that have come in. And if they're not reaching that city, that's prejudice. So it says, well, they don't want to come to my church. Well, that's because you ain't loved them and you ain't reached out to them. Don't give me that excuse. They will come if you'll love them and let them worship and tell them about Jesus. open and see what's underneath our skin. Oh, I was serious. He knew I was. I said, we'll pull the skin back on our forearms and see if there's any difference when we get past the color. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Some of you need to get past the skin color and realize there's some flesh and blood that's all the same. And let's build a church I said, let's build a church for God. Let's do something for the Lord. We all got only one father. I said, we all got only one father. And if you didn't know this, I'll tell you, every color has problems in their cultures. As a Christian, you've got to be big enough to look past the culture problems and see that person, whether it's a man or a woman, as a brother and sister yes. in the Lord. Yes. And so, you know, that's not in my notes. Come on. But it's in the book. Yes. It's in the heart of God. Amen. God so loved the world. 
Yes. There is only for God's Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Amen. That whosoever includes every yes, race and tongue. And so we need to understand that. The power of the church yes. is to deny and defy what's going on in the world. Right. Yes. And come together and show them with the common denominator of Christ Jesus. Yes. We got something that they need. Amen. Yes, we do. It's a world of hate. It's a world of ugliness. It's yes. a world of of heinous deeds that go on. That's right. And I'm going to say one more thing, and I'll get into my lesson. You need to have some people that are close friends that are not your same color. that everyone just kind of mix everything up and purposely marry somebody that's a different color and have your kids marry just so you can prove you're not prejudiced. That's stupid. <laughs> we're, not, we're not talking about that. We're talking about real love and not trying to prove something through a synthetic channel to the world that we're this, but let them see the real deal and make their own decision if they want to be part of it or not. Because every culture also has something good to bring. Right. Right. And you bring that together and there's quite a great thing in the kingdom of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So we, uh, we want to talk about prophecy. And uh, whether you know that or not, that's prophecy. In the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit up on all flesh. Okay. And that's all different colors of people. That's all different continents. That's yes. all different... And that's the great sign for the church is a massive outpouring of his spirit. Yes. There's no respect of a person. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. But we're going to talk about some other things tonight. Let's talk about this uh, uh, prophecy here. I'll make sure I got the right slide up there to get going. And I do. So we're ready to go. Let's see if it comes back up here. Maybe it won't. Maybe it will. There it is. Okay. Get your magnifying glass out. You can read all that. And, uh, but Daniel chapter 11. Praise the Lord. Daniel chapter 11. I'm glad to be here with Brother Overton. We've been having a good time. I come in a day early. And uh, we have just been catching up on old times. And he's been feeding me. I'm going right. to go a few pounds heavier. And my wife say that's good because she thinks I'm too skinny. But uh, so we all have our weaknesses. Some are a little too big and some are too, a little too thin. It's hard to find just the right. You know, I uh, love Brother John and Sister Carrie over to great friends and people. I love people that do the work of God. That's right. so special about yes, that. Yes. So Daniel chapter 11, if you read Daniel 11 all the way up to verse 35 to give you the background of it, it is dealing with the uh, first few verses is dealing with the Grecian Empire and, or excuse me, the Persian Empire and uh, it deals with that and then of course it talks just a little bit about the uh, fall of them and then it moves into the split of the Grecian Empire. And the split is between the Ptolemaic Empire, which was General Ptolemy, when, when uh, Alexandria died coming back from India, he was in the city of Babylon, he had decided to make a triangle, and he had a city that was in uh, Greece, he had a Greece, he had a city that was in uh, Egypt, and he wanted a city that was in what we call modern day Iraq, which was Babylon, and in that triangle, that would be the three capitals of his newfound kingdom. Right. And uh, he, but he first had to take that from the Persians. He took that from the Persians, and then he only lived till he was a young man in his early thirties, and then he contacted a disease, is what most people believe, maybe a yellow marsh fever or something. It's hard to know 2,400 years ago, 2,300 years ago. But whatever he got, he died 
They had a three-day funeral. Everyone in his generals and their troops marched by and looked at him, and then they uh, give him a, a funeral the way they did. And uh, then immediately the shuffling started, and the generals began to go to certain territories with their armies because they knew there was going to be a civil war. And that's the way it always happened. When a leader died, there was always a civil war. So they went to their respective places. Two of those places become very significant to us. Lysimachus, Cassander, not so important for our study tonight. They did go over toward the Turkey and the uh, Europe, East, Western European areas and split that territories. But they did not uh, involve in this particular story. This story starts with General Ptolemy, he goes down to Egypt and he becomes a pharaoh. Now he's a Greek, his family's Greek, they, enter, they, they marry their own family members to keep that Ptolemy line. And then there's the Seleucid that went to Syria, headquarters in Syria, and took the large territories there. And then they had war between each other, and of course Israel is the land bridge between them. So they would come down from the north, they would come down through Israel, they would rape the land and many other things. They would fight with Egypt. Egypt would come up and they would fight. And that's what all this is about. And it is a very detailed history to the fact that people that do not believe in the uh, Holy Ghost inspired supernatural word of God say that it was written by a persuado, meaning that he, he used the name of Daniel, but he wrote after the fact rather than before the fact. In other words, he told a lie, the writer, but tried to make it look like prophecy, but it was really history. That's how accurate it is in that if you read the history between the uh, Ptolemaic and the uh, Seleucid Empire. When you get to verse 35, all of that stops, and we have this huge gap of time, and we jump into verse 36, which starts talking about the future Antichrist. There are many reasons why we know that the future Antichrist is in view here. Part of it is his description, and one of the main things that we understand is that he does not honor any god. And the last great Ptolemaic, or rather Seleucid Empire, was Antiochus Epiphanes III, and he was a follower of Zeus. He set up an idol of Zeus, had Zeus carved with his face the Zeus bot, and he put an idol up and sacrificed a pig on December the 25th, uh, 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 167 B.C. at the Temple Mount where Solomon's Temple had stood and now the Temple of Ezra and then would be rebuilt as Herod's Temple and he did that and that started what we call the Maccabean Wars that brought down those empires and ushered in the Roman government to control that land which would build the roads so the gospel of Jesus could be spread. Yeah. This is what this is talking about. So when we get to verse 39 of 11, we are looking at the future and not the past. And it goes like this. It says in verse 39, Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God. And we've already learned, if we were to read earlier, that it's the God of force. And so his, his power will be the, the God of force that he reckons and he worships, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. It is important that we understand that the Antichrist is not afraid to attack or come after anybody. And his purpose is to take this land from Egypt to Syria and everything in between and to divide that land up. Now it's been divided many, many times. The last major division was when the British under General Allaby brought down the Turks, and then they had the League of Nations that became the controllers of the Middle East, uh, and they made the proctors of that control to be the British, and then, of course, in time, the League of Nations bankrupt, and America refinanced it, and it became the United Nations that we have today. That's kind of the short version of this. And so that land was divided. For that, it was divided more. But then it goes on to say in verse 40, and at the time of the end, and we're referring to the time of the end of the tribulation, not the church age, but the tribulation is in view here. So we're talking at somewhere after the three and a half point, where we're in the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70 weeks. It says at the time of the end, 
shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots right. and with horsemen and many ships, and he shall enter into these countries or into the country and shall overflow. This is a word that's used when we have a flood and the water rises up and just kind of floods everything. This is how his armies and his attack is going to be. It's going to literally be like a flood that rises up, goes over the banks or passes by the beachhead of the uh, current hold and it's going to move into land and just cover everything. And this is going to be what the Antichrist does. This is going to be what the North does. And this is going to be what we call Gog and Magog. It's the beginning of a major battle that is very close to taking place. Right. Verse 41 says, He shall enter also into the glorious land. The glorious land is what we understand to be the land of Israel. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of the hand, even Eden and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. So we'll stop there with that particular uh, part and we will just kind of lay our foundation. So the Antichrist at a certain point in time is going to rise up and is going to make an, an inroad to the nations in that region. And while he's doing this, there's going to be an attack against the Antichrist. Now, the Antichrist kingdom, properly speaking, is coming from the European Union, not the present form that has 28 nations, but the one that was the Western European Union that had to do with the Western, not the Eastern uh, uh, blocks of Europe, but the Western blocks. And that's where he's going to come from. He's properly going to come from Rome. Uh, or at least he's going to have ties to Rome, the city of Rome, the city of it, the, the nation of Italy, and he's going to come. So we're talking about the European people, and out of that comes a man that we call the man of sin, the man of perdition, the Antichrist. He rises up, and he has this hand that is empowered by military might. He begins to reach out and he begins to conquer and to take and to bring down strongholds. And somewhere in this, he is going to be resisted by the king of the south. Now the king of the south, we understand, is Egypt. In this passage, if we were to read verse 42, it will tell us, he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures and gold and over the silver and all the precious things of Egypt. The Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. So we know that this is the uh, southern king in the region of the Middle East, especially to Jerusalem. It's south of Jerusalem. And of course, there's other scriptures that tell us that he's moving in to set up himself as a god in the city of Jerusalem to be reached, worshipped by the world. So Egypt's going to say, we're not going to take this. And they rally all of their Islamic forces and they come against the Antichrist. On the other side, we have the Seleucid Empire that is going to rally themselves but in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, we are given additional information to this battle. And now it's not just the, the old Seleucid Empire that is the Islamic crescent that goes around through Iraq, Syria, Persia, Afghanistan, and that group. But it goes up into Russia, joining with them and moving down to attack the Antichrist. And this begins World War III that the Bible terms as Armageddon. All right. Yes. Now, the questions that we ask and the, the questions that we want to know is how in the world is Israel a little bitty country that presently doesn't even have the size of Rhode Island? It's a little smaller than Rhode Island have the ability to cause the entire world to focus in on them and say, we want 
your land. We want your goods. And we want Jerusalem. Have you ever wondered that? Why is the world so interested in the Jewish people? Their numbers in Israel are about 7 to 8 million people. Their numbers outside of Israel are about 7 to 10 million people. They're a little under 20 million people. And the world's population is now over 7.3 billion people and growing. Why in the world would 7 billion 300 million people be interested in about 8 million little Jews on a piece of land that is so small that doesn't up to this point have shown to have any resources whatsoever. And there are three major reasons why they have an interest in this. First is that this is the place that God said my name will be there for ever. And they hate the God of this yes. people called the Jews. Mm -hmm. The Jews don't know who their God is because they rejected Messiah. But we who have been grafted into the fatness of the root, according to Romans, we know who the God of the Jews is. That's, that's one reason. The second reason is, is they cannot fight or hurt God. And the world is haters of God. You don't believe that. you got problems. Specifically the God of the Bible. Not just God in general. You can get up and say I'm a Muslim. And people will praise you. You can get up and say I'm a Buddhist. Say oh that's great. You can say I'm into Shintoism. And people say oh that's neat. You can say, I'm a Satanist, and some say, ooh, that's kind of spooky, eh? Yeah. <laughs> you say you're a Christian, and you got the plaque. Yeah. You say you're a Jew, and you're that little group of people that, that everyone is against. Right. You know why? Because they know that that God is not like their God, right. and that God is different than all the other gods in the world. Yeah. And so, they cannot fight the invisible God. They can't hurt God. No. He just laughs at their calamity. Yeah. Go ahead and take your fist and try and hit God tonight. Mm -hmm. It won't hurt him. Go ahead and try it. <laughs> what did I do? I didn't do nothing. But God's there. Yeah. But I didn't have the ability to touch him. Right. I got to touch him by faith. Yeah. I got to touch him by repentance. I got to yeah. touch him by believing. And call it on his name. But they think they can touch God by attacking him. And God just sits back and laughs at their calamity. So the next best thing is to attack people that represent him. That they can inflict pain on. So I go after the Jews. And what did I do? I got God. I go after Christians. And what did I do? I got God. So they go after the visible part of that God has made temples and they attack them. They go after the visible part of those that have bared the name and not yes. given up on it. And they attack them if they think they're getting God. Right. The uh -huh. fools that they are. Mm -hmm. Come on. There's a third reason. God said that that was his land. Mm -hmm. So I made the whole earth, I give it, divided the nations, the table of nations, sent you all over, gave you land with resources and all this, and that's my land. Turn with me to the book of Joel, if you would. And read what happens when the Lord comes back to this world to set up his literal kingdom at the end of the tribulation when the millennium begins to start. Verse 1 says, For behold, in those days of chapter 3, Joel chapter 3 verse 1. For behold in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. That means when I will take their bondage and I will release them and I myself will be their ruler. That's what that's referring to. I will also gather all nations. United States of America. Right. All nations. A lot of people trying to always weave America in as some big great nation that's going to last forever. Friend, America is coming down with the rest of them. Yes. 
Now, I'm very patriotic. I love my country, and while I'm here, I'm going to be a good citizen. And I'm going to fight for righteousness. But when the church is gone, it don't matter what God does with this place. They hate him. They fought him. They fight the church. They hate the church. They'll get their due. But while I'm here, I'm going to stand up to them, and I'm going to reach who I can and speak out against all the evil and all the wrong they're doing. And I'm just going to stand my ground. And then one day the trumpet's going to sound, I'm going to leave here, and there won't be anybody here that, that, that the Lord's going to feel he has an obligation to protect. Amen. And America's going to be in a lot, a lot of trouble. Amen. Until that time, the church better hold their place because we're the force that holds back hell from having its way. Right. And I particularly don't want to live in the same place and let the devil have any victory. I don't even want the devil to get my toothpick when I get through picking my teeth and throwing the trash. I don't want him to have nothing of mine. And I'm going to give him fits until the Lord calls me home. Yes. And I'm going to attack every stronghold he has that gets in the way of the revival of God Christ. And it binds up my children. It binds up people. I'm not going to allow that to happen. And so they're going to mess with his land. They're going to mess with his people. And they're going to mess with the place and desecrate it by worshiping Allah and finally worshiping the devil himself. The last final world religion is Satanism. Because the Bible says they're going to worship the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is the personification of the dragon. And the dragon is Satan himself. Yes. It is going to be the worst form of idolatry. It's going to worship a man that has been possessed completely by the devil. It's called Satanism at its most uh, highest level ever that the world will know. Yes. So verse 2 says, I will gather all nations. That's the European nations. That's the nations in Africa. That's all the Muslim nations. That's the nations in the East, Japan and China. It's all nations. Yes. Not some, not a few, but it's all. And we'll bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. Yes. Now the valley of Jehoshaphat, if you stand on the Temple Mount and you look out to the east, you will see there is a small valley there that we call today the Kindred Brook. And it goes through there. And there used to be an arch over it that led to the hill. Well, if you look directly from the door of the, that, that to the east, that is what we call the Mountain of Olives or the Mount of Olives that the scripture writes about. And they would walk off of the temple compound, cross over that bridge, be on the, temple, or be on the Mount of Olives, and that's somewhere where the Garden of Gethsemane was. So it's very close proximity. But there is a fault... Be, um, that goes through the Mount of Olives. And so the geologists in Israel have disallowed new building in that area. And it's a perfect place for some motels, for tourists, but no longer will they let them build there because of, there is coming a tremendous earthquake. And the way that it's laid out, the Bible tells us that when that fault happens, Jesus is going to come back from heaven and put his feet upon this yes. earth. And when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, the mountain is going to split in two yes. and become flat or a plain. If that mountain is moved and the mountain range behind them, then that takes you from the Temple Mount all the way out into the country of Jordan, a flat piece, and you could literally bring the nations of the world through there for judgment. Yes. It can't happen before, but it will happen when his feet touch it, and he lays that land out. We All find right. this in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12 through 14. Come on. Jesus. And so we have this coming, and he says, I will gather you in the valley of Jehoshaphat. The Kindred Brook is also the valley of Jehoshaphat. It runs between the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mount. And then he says, and will plead or will judge them there for my people and for my heritage Israel. And the people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Let's talk about that. There was a scattering of the nations when the first real major scattering took place was the Gentiles called Babylonians that attacked Jerusalem in 605 B.C. Then there was relative peace for 10 years, and then in 597, 
B.C. they were attacked again. And then in 586 B.C. on the month of Av, the ninth day, the temple of Solomon was burnt to the ground and there was no more a temple and they were scattered. Now the ten tribes prior to that had been scattered in 722 when there was the Assyrians that had attacked them and deported them from around. And they began to deport them. But what happened is Hezekiah was in power during that time and he had begun to start the Passovers and many of those people he had been in contact were coming down from the ten tribes and worshiping and turning back to Yahweh for service. So when the Assyrians attacked the ten tribes, those that were making connection and had been coming down for worship, they left and fled into Judah. And that way, all twelve tribes were preserved in Judah and they were not scattered. So it wasn't just Judah and Benjamin, but it was the, a representative of all twelve tribes. All right. They were not scattered completely until that happened. Then we find little reprieves in between and then we find again another great scattering after the Jerusalem is attacked by the Romans in 70 AD. We go to 72 AD and there's temple that Herod built is taken to the ground. It took him 65 years to build it and they tore it down in one night and burnt it with fire. And you can still see the stones in Israel that are scorched with the hot flames that cause 